Welcome to the Enduro Method podcast. Enduro Method is an online strength and conditioning program built for those who ride by those who ride. We are professional coaches dedicated to building the best and most revolutionary off the bike training for dirt bikers around. We are offering a special discount for our podcast listeners. Use discount code EMPODCAST22 for 50% off your first month. For more information, head to the description of this podcast where you can find the discount code and a link for more information and to sign up. Welcome to the Enduro Method Podcast. Dan and Josh here today, and we're going to talk about how to pick weights for your workout. Hello. So, going to try and keep this as brief as possible, hopefully give some insight, and um, mostly toward kind of our programming and useful ways to think about it. Um, we're going to start off and talk about... Or just how- any programming, I mean how to pick your weight in any workout true but we're also going to be talking probably specifically some numbers and like how we program um so it'll be definitely useful for that but the concepts will work across the board so we'll start off with how to kind of go about picking weights for strength work and then after that go into how to pick out weights for um, kind of conditioning conditioning work instead of necessarily strength work so i think just in general a way to think about it is strength work you're always trying to get to weights that are hard but doable for you for the rep range required um so if the reps are like three reps of let's say a back squat right you need to get up to weights that are hard but doable for you for three reps and if the weights call out for like a 10 rep back squat you know just by the nature of that that you're going to be doing less weight, but you're also still trying to get to weights that are hard but doable for you in that rep range. Why that's important, um, let's go back to the three reps example. If you don't find weights that are hard but doable for you for three reps, you're not going to get a stimulus that's going to cause any changes in the, in the system, right? So because the reps are so low, the weight has to be heavy and has to challenge your you know, muscle fiber, central nervous system, whatever, the whole thing, right? And so if you're not pushing that weight to where it's challenging for you, you're not gonna get a stimulus. Same thing at the 10 rep range, even though the weight's lighter, because the reps are higher, right? It's gonna be hard in that way. So as a general rule, you're always whatever the rep call out range is you're just trying to get at weights that are again hard but doable for you it's a good term because everybody's different on this across the board you're going to be different you know in week one than you are on week 10 right so it just kind of grows with you as you continue to get stronger as well i would just like to add in like um hard but doable is great but you're just like basically you're feeling a stimulus if you don't feel a stimulus, then that's where it's like, kind of like, well, what's what's the point, I guess? But just ensuring that you're getting a stimulus to the body. Yeah, and you know, there's a lot of times in strength work, depending on programs and all that stuff, people call out for percentage work, um, which is a great way to go about it but that also means that you have to know essentially either a two rep three rep or one rep max for each lift Um, some of you might know that and that's great and you can use that as a guide on your own if you do but it's not always the best approach for someone new to lifting weights to go in and find a one rep max on a lift Um, and the other part of that is that one rep max is probably not going to be too great of a representation of where you're at even four weeks later. So that numbers, when you're new to lifting, that number is going to change real quick over time. And the more advanced you are, um, that number is going to change real slowly over time. And if you've had, it's very easy for us that maybe have been lifting longer to think that we're stronger than we are because, you know, six weeks ago we we're pretty strong, but then we had some off time, whether due to anything, sickness, vacation, time off, riding more, whatever, you come back and you're like, oh yeah, use that old number. 
um, even though that's not where you currently are. So then you start doing percentage work off it. And um, anyways, that's a whole other deal. But the I, using an idea or a RPE, if you will. What's RPE? I know what it is, but... Rate of perceived many, exertion. Somebody might not know yeah, what yeah. it is. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, rate of perceived exertion. Um, it's a good way to go through thinking of conditioning work. It's a good way to go through th uh, strength work. Um, so 10 being like as hard or as much as you could possibly lift for the reps required. And then using, you know, a scale of it's one down to ten. one would be like body weight, right? Super easy. You could do this for a long time. And so living in a in a area of like seven and seven to eight probably rpe most of the time is probably going to be a pretty good place to be i don't know about that what i don't know i've i like to live sometimes in five and six hmm. like on sustained days <laughs> yeah yeah uh sorry still talking about strength work oh, okay. because this is gonna again there there's no right answer that's just going to fit across the board. But in the world of strength work, if you're continually doing what we'd call like quote unquote working sets, right, where we're doing, we're getting our work done because everything before working sets is like warm up sets. Then you have working sets, which are at a weight that's hard but doable. Um, that would be in that seven to eight, or uh, yeah, seven to eight range RPE typically. And if you can get there and you do the work there, you're going to be pretty good off. Um, so what this might look like as an example, let's say we got build work. And again, this would be specific to our program, but you got build work. We're doing four rounds of 10 back squat. Um, and then we got, and that's the main lift. That one's first. And then we got to make two other accessory things, right? Five pull-ups. All right, five pull-ups and a 30-second plank hold. Okay, so this is where knowing where you are on the spectrum comes into play as well. So let's say you're a brand new lifter or brand new to training. Um, and uh, not, you know, that you haven't done a lot of back squatting and you're probably not going to be adding a lot of weight. So you got four rounds. We're looking to get to round three and have that the first working set. So we're only looking for kind of two working sets. So you use round one and two to build and weight on the back squat, but you really don't know yet how much you can do for 10 reps. So round one, maybe you just do empty bar for 10 right then you do your five pull-ups do your plank how would you so like i'm just trying to think as a person and from doing a lot of personal training myself of like okay how do okay great josh how do i increase weight each round until the hard but doable um and one thing to keep in mind um is the lower body movements the squats the deadlifts um you can add bigger increments with less of an of a effect versus upper body. So if you put 10 pounds on each side on a back squat, 20, add 20 pounds total, that's gonna be a lot different than if you put 20 pounds total on your strict press. Yes. That's a big jump. Totally. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. And then as a new lifter, it's really just going off a of feel. Start light, feel it, and then the number one thing is just to pay attention. How hard was that? Um, could I add weight? And then start sl small. Like it's better to go small increments at the beginning as a new lifter than it is to just slap a whole bunch of weight on and then you're like getting stuck in the bottom of, of a squat. In this example of 10 back squats, like start way lighter than, you know, start on the light end. Um, and really pay attention to how it feels and then make your adjustment from there. Maybe that first round you do, you're like, well, that was pretty good, actually. I feel like by reps eight, nine, and 10, it was spicy. So like, maybe you just stay, stay there for the last four rounds. And then also like, don't be afraid to pull weight off. If you go maybe too heavy or you're like, oh, that was too much. Like you can always go back. Like there's no, 
it's it's not black and white like you can change it yeah absolutely so again like on the first round you'd go empty bar you do your 10 back squats you do your pull-ups do your plank you come back around and to dane's point you're paying attention to how it feels and you're like pretty light pretty easy right um so i got way more in there so essentially in this example that you're explaining, you really only have two working sets? Yeah, that would be round one because you're new to lifting. You know that you have no idea where you're going on back squat. So you're using the first two rounds to get a feel for it and just get an idea and get started because that's all we're doing, especially when you're brand new to lifting. All right? You just got to start somewhere. You don't know where that is yet, so start light. And then as you progress through the rounds, just keep adding weight. So round two, you start at 45 pounds, that's empty bar. You're like, cool, that was easy. No problem. I'm going to throw 15s on either side. So that puts me at 75 pounds. Do 10 reps. Still able to maintain good form. Definitely feel it a little more. Legs are working. But feel pretty good about that one. Do your pull-ups. Do your plank. Come back around. So that was a 30 pound jump from 45 to 75. Like, I got a little more in me. I'm gonna go to 95 pounds. So now I'm only gonna put 10s on either side. You do your 10 and maybe by like rep number eight, you had to pause a second or two at the top, catch your breath. Now you really gotta focus on keeping your weight back, not letting the bar kind of push you forward a little bit in the bottom, right, standing up. And you're like, that was pretty good for me. That was hard, but doable. I don't even need to go up and wait for my fourth round. I'm going to stay at 95 pounds, knock out my last set. That was even a little bit harder because I've also built up fatigue over the last three rounds that I've done. Boom, hit my pull-ups, hit my plank, done for the day. I'm going to make sure to take note that I did 45 pounds on round one. 75 pounds on round two, 95 pounds for round three, and 95 pounds for round four. Now, skipping all the rest of the week, we come back to the same day on the next week, and we have the same strength piece. So now, I know just from the first week that I, you know, what I did, and I'm going to put that into play and do 45 pounds again on round one. I liked that jump of 75 pounds on round two, so stick with that. I'm going to come back and see how 95 pounds feels for round three. And then maybe if I feel good on and I have a little bit more experience now, I might go up to 105 or something for round four, right? So again, we're still, we're starting light. We're increasing weight as we go. We're getting two solid working rounds in, round three and round four. And I increase slightly in weight from last week. That's a win, right? Um, this same example could be used for an advanced, more advanced lifter. The only thing that's going to change is the weight jumps might be slightly bigger and the ending weights are a little bit heavier. And you might do war- more warm up sets. Exactly. So I'll just going to use myself as an example. If I had, if I was doing this strength piece, I would still start with an empty bar. I would do 10 reps. I would rack the bar. I would throw maybe 25s on each side. I would do 10. I might not do 10. I might do five or six reps. But I would do 10. You would do 10. So, but I'm going to do, I'm still going to build and make small jumps. I'm just going to do those real quick back to back before I start round one because I know when I get to my last, I know where I want to end. Put it that way. I have an idea in my head and it might change a little bit. But let's say I want to get to 225 for my last set of 10 reps on back squat. My jumps might look something like round one would be 135, but I'm not going to that cold. That's where I go back, and I already did my empty bar stuff. I did 95 pounds for 5 to 10 reps, and I'm just not using that as my actual strength sets. I'm just doing that beforehand because I don't want to go from the whatever dynamic warm-up we did with no weight to straight to 135 for 10 because I'm not really warmed up yet. I haven't been doing the movement. So again, empty bar start, split the difference in weight somewhere, 
hit another set. So round one, I might do 135. Round two, I might go 165 or 185 for 10. Round three, 205 for 10. And then round four would be 225 for 10. And if that's the beginning of the block and I got three more weeks coming up with the strength work, I'm gonna try and increase my weight weekly on that set of 10, right? And so maybe at the end of four weeks, it looks something like I still do all my empty bar warm up. I split the difference in weight round one. Maybe I'm starting at 155 instead of 135. Round two, I'm going right to 185 or maybe 205. And then round three, I'm looking at maybe doing that one at 225. And round four has now worked up to, you know, 235 or 245, something like that. And from a big picture, that's a solid build over the four weeks. Um, and one more thing on this, if, you know, if you're newer, you're just trying to figure out what weights to get to, keep track and work with those. If you're intermediate or more advanced, you've been doing it for a while and you got some numbers in your head where you're at. You, it's still advantageous to always start new blocks, new four week blocks, leaving a little bit in the tank. There's nothing kind of more demoralizing and, and just kind of hard on you than like you start a new program and you're, you just went too heavy too soon. And then halfway through, you can't hit the reps, you can't hit the, and we're not doing percentages, but, and that's part of the reason why too, because percentages just don't account for weekly fluctuations and energy strength and all that stuff, which is definitely a real thing. So always leave a little bit in the tank on week one. Let yourself progress through and heavier. Um, it's always a pretty, pretty good way to go. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Missed anything? Yeah, I guess the only thing I was going to say is, um, like, if you ever feel like your form is changing due to the load of the, um, due to the load, then that is also a sure, f like, sh like a sh trigger. <laughs> that is your red flag that maybe you should go back off and wait if you feel like you can't maintain good technique. Yeah. Um, what I like to use the example when I'm working with people is if you have, if you, again, we'll just stick with back squat, but if you have somebody perform an air squat and then perform an unloaded or light back squat, it should look pretty similar. There might be a little bit of difference because there's now load on the shoulders and torso angle and all that stuff, but it should be very similar. Whatever that light back squat looks like should not change as the weight gets heavier. Range of motion, so depth of squat should not change. Um, foot position should not be rotating or moving. Knees should be tracking over toes. Chest should be staying tall, right? All those things. Core should be staying tight. There should be no changes in spinal position as you squat. So whatever that looks like light should look identical to heavy. Mm -hmm. And if it does not, um, drop weight, don't push it, and, and work your way back up to where you can maintain the same squat light and heavy. Yeah. Yeah. And that goes for all lifts. That's not just squat. That's deadlift. That's bench press. That's push up. That's pull up. All yeah. of it. Everything should be able to be performed the same. This also goes for conditioning work. You should, movement should not change under fatigue. And if it does, rest, right? Um, that's something that I think CrossFit got in trouble with early was that model of it's always intensity first at the expense. And it wasn't necessarily preached that way. I'm not saying, but it happened that way. That movement quality went out the window for intensity. And in the long run, it's not worth it. I know it happens occasionally, but the less it happens, the better. I mean, yeah, that goes for training on a dirt kind of bike. Avoid it. I yeah, try and totally. think of like myself, like when I'm pushing it, but I also like, I'm thinking of like, for example, a burpee. Well, yeah, you know, I don't necessarily ever put myself in a compromised position. I just get slower, <laughs> right? you know, um, versus like, I'm thinking of like 
totally arching my back way too much when I come up or something like that. But I'm always super protective of my back. And I refuse to do a burpee like that in to sacrifice my form and my back position to, to I don't even know what that would achieve me really but um yeah you know deadlifts is I would say the most common one you know getting lazy on setting your back in a proper position to achieve more reps or heavier weight yeah it's not worth it no right so and the, the more you set yourself up early with keeping that principle of hard but doable and no change in technique as you as load increases the the further you'll get with it and the more uh, chance of staying injury free safety first all right um so from a strength perspective all of those same things apply if instead of you know you're doing 10 reps you're doing three reps it's just now you're going to be going heavier in weight or load at the end. So maybe you got to do more sets early. So then when you start round one, you're starting a little bit heavier so the jumps aren't as big. You're talking about for a, an example with three reps instead of ten? Yeah. So I'll just, again, use myself as an example. If I was going to work up to three back squats in the same scenario, we had four rounds, three back squats, five pull up 30 second plank i would do way more sets early before starting round one with the back squat just real quick but again i'm just working up and load so i might i'd still start with an empty bar still probably do 10 reps i'd still probably jump to 95 but i might only do five then i'd go 135 five probably 185 five and then i might start my first round at 225 for three then my second round might be you know 255 or 275 for three my third round might be 305 for three and my last round might be 315 for three something like that so again the concepts are still the same i'm still making relatively decent sized jumps but they're within reason with how much weight i can lift and where i want to get to and i'm just i'm not starting round one cold at 185 on back squat this is not a good way to go even if i'm already warm let's say i already did some other strength work before this i have not done any weight in this pattern so i want to start light and increase what if you're a new lifter and let's say you're only going up to 100 pounds for three well i was going to say what if you're a new lifter and you're not comfortable adding a whole lot of weight on three reps Earlier in the podcast, you said you, that won't have any effect. Well, it does relative to the person. So if you're still finding three reps is hard but doable for you as a new lifter, you're still getting the benefit. What I'm saying is if that new lifter only did three reps at an empty barbell, but they had the potential to do 100 pounds, they're not going to get the same effect from only doing three reps with an empty bar. So it's all relative to the individual. All right, weights for conditioning. Um, this will be, I don't know, maybe not a little bit harder, but it's just as important. So I think all of this in general takes some practice. Some, dis, some uh, tracking weights over time is always a good thing because it gives you guidelines to go back and look at. There are, like for instance, again, the CrossFit gives RX weights for conditioning pieces. We do not. Um, because what, I mean, I've found most of the time those RX weights are heavier than most people should be to begin with. And then under unsupervised conditions, it can potentially set people up to build bad habits. And so I don't, we don't, I don't usually give any RX recommendations for conditioning work. I think I have sometimes, but not often. I would rather give some guidelines and then people can make choices from there. Um, and it is so specific to the workouts, the intent of the workout and all that stuff. So 
But just in general, from a conditioning perspective, we call mixed modal quite a bit. So that would be like where you're doing uh, lifting moves in a breathing situation. And we can still work through all the energy systems during this stuff. But your weights are also going to be weight selections also a part of that. So you could just in general think of the lighter the weight you use, the faster you can move. So the more breathing dominant that particular session is going to be. The heavier weight you choose, the slower you're going to move. And the more muscle fatiguing that conditioning piece is going to be. So you're going to have this shift from like super high breathing turnover and and muscle you're going to have muscle fatigue but less like you're not going to have to stop because you can't do another um let's use thrusters as an example with dumbbells right so you have thrusters thrusters which is a squat and a press all in one movement right so you squat down dumbbells are in a front rack position you do a full squat you press them up overhead at the top if you're using 15 pounds in your thrusters and let's say this is a male example who could who could knock 10 reps out with 50 pound dumbbells if he's using 15 pound dumbbells he's not going to have to stop and rest because of muscle failure he might have to stop and rest because of eventually because of muscle fatigue mixed with lack of oxygen right breathing super high um or, or unconditioned or whatever the reason. But if you put that same person example with 50 pound dumbbells, they might be only, only able to do three reps at a time without having to take a break between each of those little rep sets. So the weights that you pick for this style of training matters um, with the intent for the workout, right? There's a time and place to go super heavy and push yourself in that aspect and then there's also a time and place to stay lighter and push yourself in that aspect. So dura uh, duration of the workout matters. If it's a five minute conditioning piece or a 20 minute conditioning piece, the intent of the workout matters. What's in the description for the workout. If you're supposed to go a little bit heavier and push yourself or if our intent is more to stay aerobic without muscle failure kind of thing. So paying attention to reading descriptions is important. Um, what do you got? Mm, yeah, I mean, I think all that sounds good. Um, I think reiterating what you said earlier, just to track it all. If you're brand new, the only way to like figure this all out is to record it, you know? And do it. And do it. And I would say... You know, we've been doing this for over 10 years, so I think we take it for granted what, what weights to pick. Like, I just know. I can see, look at the workout, and I just know. And the reason why this topic came up is I've had a few, these are just athletes at our gym, people that have been working with me personally one-on-one um, -on -one, and then graduate to classes. And their question to me is, like, how do I know what weights to pick? Because technically, when they're working with me in, in a personal training session, you know, I usually just pick it, but I don't necessarily base up based on what I know about their capability. But typically, I don't often give an explanation, which maybe I should. Um, and I was like, well, this would be good for Endura method to be like, you know, what weight should I pick? You know, so training age. You know, we we just know um, based on doing it for for so long, um, and be patient with it and pay attention is. The biggest thing um in a conditioning piece also like if you're looking at the workout and it's got the dumbbell thrusters in it for example like grab some weights and try it out okay how'd that feel you know do maybe half the reps that you need to do like if it's 10 reps maybe do five be like okay can i do this and how many times realistically do i think i need to like kind of kind of guess you know and then and don't be afraid to change weights in the middle of the workout either you know if you need to um, as long as you're not using that as like a cop out for it being hard. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, uh, I think that's a good point. I think, I think doing it and tracking it, there's no like outside of obviously hurting yourself. There's no wrong way. 
especially if you're just trying to figure it out. Like if you do an entire workout with a pair of dumbbells and you're like, that was too light, fantastic. Write that in your notes, keep a track of it. And next time something like that comes up, go a little heavier, right? Like you're gonna have to do some self-exploration to be able to figure out how to go about this. I mean, that's all all of us have done anyways. It's just we've been doing it longer potentially and so just have that experience to pull on. But it's just about building up your own experience and um, you know, don't get caught up in like only today's workout matters kind of mentality. Because in fact, I would rather see almost everybody across the board lessen the intensity slightly or use a little bit lighter weight if that means longevity and in training like it's consistency over time that matters not how much can i lift or how hard can i go today in fact if 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 those things are the cause of you not training for the next three or four days it's way less advantageous than backing off of that and training you know day in and day out Yeah. All right. Anything else you want to add? I mean, I'm sure there's stuff, but um, general concepts start light, right? Work toward heavy weight. Always warm up the movement first. Um, the only the only times I really don't feel you have to do warm up weights is like if you go. I mean, Dane kind of alluded to it, and it's still a decent idea, especially if you don't know where to go. But if, like, you go through a whole strength set, so you go through four rounds of your strength work and into your conditioning, and you're using much lighter weights for your conditioning, you don't need to do a bunch of reps to warm up for that. Yeah, you're really just using them as testers if, if yeah, you need. Yeah, exactly. You might, you might do a couple just to get a feel and an idea if that weight's right for you, but you're probably good to go right into the conditioning work. Um and again, we put all that stuff in our instructions and guidelines. And if we think that you need more warm up, it's in there, you know. So, um, yeah, the same concept can be used for pacing on ergs and um, everything else. You just got to start, start doing it, track it, track your distances, track your times, track your intensities, and then you'll have a reference moving forward. Yeah. All right, I think that's about it. All right, thanks for listening to this episode of the Enduro Method podcast. You can find us if you have other questions, comments, whatever you name it, enduromethod.com. You can also reach out to us on the social media at Enduro Method. Um, and then make sure to check out the promo for our podcast subscribers, subscribers and listeners, um, and get yourself on some Enduro Method programming. Um, thanks for listening and we'll catch you next time. Thanks. Thank you.